Welcome to Theories and Problems in Visual Art. This is history lecture number 18 on writing world art histories. It's an introduction to the next several lectures and we shall be talking about um, other art history texts, contemporary texts around the world. Um, I first want to introduce the idea of writing a world art history, which is not something that every culture has done, uh, and then survey a couple of European world art histories and contrast them against American, North American, world art history textbooks. It's interesting that there were no texts on world art history before the 19th century in Germany. The idea of sitting down to write or teach world art history was itself a German idea, and then after World War II it was also primarily North American interest. This is Kadi Ahmad, which we saw in lecture 15, um, the 16th century Persian uh, text called Calligraphers and Painters. Kadi Ahmad knew about Chinese painting. He praises it a couple times. And he had also seen some Western Europe painting, European painting, which he calls Frankish. Um, but he doesn't make any attempt to write their histories. He's not interested in them. They're not part of the... They're not part of the Islamic tradition, for one thing, and also it's not a concept in this book that you would want to or need to, or it would make any sense to write the history of art of the whole world. That's not too different from Vasari, um, because he knew about Northern European, European painting. He knew about Flemish painting like Van Eyck. Um, he didn't like it very much, um, and uh, he and his friend Michelangelo um, talked about it sometimes, and there's a dialogue in which uh, Michelangelo uh, belittles um, northern um, European painting. Um, but Vasari also wasn't interested in writing its history. It didn't some, it wasn't something that occurred to him to do. So the most, I suppose, fundamental thing to think about when you're taking world art history is that it's historically strange to be in a culture where it seems like a good idea to write the history of the whole world. So a bit about European world art histories. I'm just going to give some examples of these. They're not books that I'm recommending that you go and read, um, but they are important to know about them because they are the prehistory of what we do. So the first world art histories were German. Franz Kugler's Handbook of Art History, which you see here, was the first, or one of the first, 1841. Only a few of its 920 pages, 113 of them, I think, exactly, are about art outside of Europe, and that's mostly architecture. Uh, he's talking about monuments and ruins of cities and so on. And some parts of the world and some and practice and media are hardly mentioned. There's a little bit over one page, for example, on Chinese painting. These masters, he says, quote, probably had a dark intuition that something else is important in art other than just reflecting the outside world. That's like, that's the most uh, amazingly cursory uh, and vague bit of praise that I've seen in an art history textbook. Basically, um, Entire cultures are missing uh, from this text, but it was, um, it was uh, pioneering in its day. The, the next development in German world art histories was multi-volume texts, putting in more detail. The first multi-volume history was Karl Schnaz's History of the Fine Arts, um, which begins with the long essay on aesthetics, uh, because Schnaz was a student of Hegel, um, and we're going to consider that Hegelian ideas um, more in later uh, history lectures. Vormann's um, History of Art of All People, of All Ages and People, which you see here in six volumes, was the most widely read. And notice the date, 1900-1922. The beginning of the 20th century, uh, projects were still being started before the First World War and all the way up to the Second World War. Vormann's first volume, out of his six volumes, is called the Art of Pre- and Non-Christian People, which is not a title that you could write these days. Um, and that's an example of one of his uh, first illustrations in the book. Almost all of that first volume is on Greeks and Romans, and there are only brief sections on prehistory and the art of what he calls the Orient, which means um, Babylon, Egypt, and about 15 pages on ages. So not much, um, and the history turns fairly quickly to Europe. Some of these early German world art histories start even back farther in time, there's one by a scholar named Johannes Emmer, uh, which begins with what he calls proto or primeval history, Urgeschichte of art, uh, which is natural artistic forms, in this case made by microorganisms, plankton. 
Um, but then he goes really quickly on toward Greece and Rome and then up toward Christian Europe. These, these pre-war German textbooks um, give only a small amount of space to non-Christian, non-Western art. In the second half of the 20th century, uh, that's when world art history became much more inclusive, when the center of production of them moved to North America. But before I talk about that, I just want to show another kind of world art history, which is the encyclopedia or the reference work. So these are not textbooks. Uh, they wouldn't have been assigned, but they would be in the library for reference. And most countries develop these, uh, most, most countries that have a lot of art history, especially in Europe, develop these before uh, mid-century, mid-20th century. The standard German one, which is still in print, um, is the Propylaea of art history, which means um, entrances. That's a, the Propylaea is an entrance to a Greek temple, so gateways or entrances to art history. Um, here's an 18 volume edition of that. A newer one is 28 volumes. In Spain, there's one by Jose Pijuan, uh, who wrote the first number of volumes himself, and the current edition is up to 54 volumes, I think, plus six DVDs. And in the United States, uh, there is this, the Grove Dictionary of Art, which used to be called the Macmillan Dictionary of Art, and then was called the Grove Dictionary, and now it's called Oxford Grove Dictionary. Um, and uh, usually it would be, um, you would consult it online if your institution pays the subscription. This is another big issue, uh, which is not part of these lectures, uh, but should be part of any you know, time you're thinking about, if you're thinking seriously about the institution of art history that a number of places in the world can't afford these online subscriptions. Um, so at the School of the Art Institute, we have a subscription. You can look at this online, an updated edition. Um, if we didn't, couldn't afford that, we would have just what you see here, the printed uh, edition. And if we couldn't afford that, you wouldn't have either one. And that's, that kind of thing is quite common. Anyway, this is the largest of these um, encyclopedias of art. Um, and there are uh, in articles on individual things like cities, the art of Istanbul, for example, that are larger than any independent book on the same subject, like that would be larger than any independent book on the art of Istanbul. So this is absolutely enormous. They claim they had 7,600 art historians um, contributing to it. After the Second World War, the production of world art history textbooks um, shifted, the centers of production shifted to Anglophone uh, countries and especially to the United States. And then at that point, um, these uh, books were often marketed as textbooks as opposed to reference works, as in the last examples. Uh, most of them are North American. Um, and in lecture 21, uh, we'll look at three of them, Stockstad, Gardner, and Janssen, which are frequently assigned in colleges and art schools and universities. They, uh, they're published mostly in the US and the UK. And they are used around the world. They're also pirated widely around the world. Um, but they are, and they are therefore, a kind of internationally exported representation of US values. In other words, they're not culturally neutral. They come from this part of the world, um, even though they're used in other parts of the world. And there is a philosophy or an orientation or an ideology that you could read in them. There's uh, Horst Janssen's History of Art. It's one of the most popular ones in universities, um, not so popular in art schools and academies. So postmodern American values that are in these books include things like internationalism, um, especially uh, post-war North American internationalism um, and uh, largesse uh, in relation to the rest of the world um, and uh, the kind, that kind of internationalism that comes with prosperity. Uh, multiculturalism, a word that came into use slightly later, uh, and diversity even later. Those three words, by the way, pretty much go in a sequence from around the time of the, of the Second World War, um, multiculturalism in the, in the 70s and 80s, diversity in the, in the uh, 21st century. Um, and they're also supported, this, this diversity of narratives and, and cultures and so on, also supported by the core master narrative of European arts, which is essentially the same as it is in the older textbooks. That is to say, the Greece, Rome, Middle Ages, um, Renaissance um, sequence, the master narrative. This is the second edition of Helen Gardner's Art Through the Ages, which was first published in 1926, which we're going to look at in more detail because uh, she was uh, uh, originally a teacher at the School of the Art Institute, um, and hers is one of the earliest of these um, American textbooks. 
It's sometimes said that her textbook was the first one to include extensive chapters on non-Western art, but that's actually only true starting in the third edition. She supervised three editions, and now it's a giant textbook that's, uh, that's gone through many editions. But she herself supervised three editions, and it was only really the third edition when she started to expand um, beyond uh, the master narrative and the, and the examples that had been already um, used in the German pre-war um, textbooks. So I just want to conclude with two points to set up the survey of text that we're going to look at in the next couple of lectures. First of all, that the idea of writing a world art history is itself both recent and Western. Um, and that is to say European and North American, because both German and American scholars had reasons to want to represent the entire world. Reasons which were not on the horizon. They weren't conceptualized. They wouldn't have been understood or valued by people like Kadi Ahmad or Vasari or the others. And second, that um, pre-war German and post-war American texts are different. The German books are universal histories. Um, that is to say, they start wherever they start, including all the way back at Plankton. Um, but they, they, those opening chapters are a small part of the text, and the, the German texts um, always have a single continuous block. The majority of the text of the book itself uh, is European art, um, the European Christian tradition. But the American books, by contrast, are internationalist. I should say American and UK and Australian and other uh, books in the Anglophone sphere that were produced after the Second World War. They're internationalist but they have at their core that same master narrative, which, has, which had at that point never been critiqued.